We're going to continue Unit 2, The Atom. And we're still kind of venturing through the first part of Chapter 2 before we get into Chapter 6 stuff. Reviewing uh, one of the last slides of last time that J.J. Thompson discovered the electron using an electric current through gases at low pressure. Okay. That was the, uh, happens in 1897. Now, whether or not the paper was published in 1897 or what, whether or not the uh, other stuff was done, I don't know. Uh, it was sometimes you can do something for two years, you know, maybe it was discovered, but then you verified it for two years and then published the paper. Don't know. So that's why the dates only help us kind of put things in a timeline. They don't say, boom, in what year did Thompson do this? I'm not going to ask that question. It's going to be more of what did Thompson do? What he did was use a cathode ray tube. Cathode ray tubes were very commonly found in televisions or CRT computer monitors. Now we have some of the parts still there where you have a cathode anode electric currents and they're passing through the magnet part and that helps us focus the rays so to speak and now he was able to measure the charge to mass ratio of the electron which is kind of a big deal they knew it was negative because the the electric plates that we have here when they were not electrified, the beam passed straight through. But when the beam was electrified, the beam curved. Because according to physics, opposites attract and like charges repel so if you have a negative charged particle it is going to be attracted to the positive plate that's why it bends down if Thompson would have had a positive charge in there it would have curved a different direction. And it is that that helps us determine that the cathode ray and the cathode ray tube gives us that negative aspect of it. Further expanded that to give us the uh, charge to mass ratio not something that I normally require students to memorize there's very few numbers I ask you to memorize so he wasn't the only person that is working with the electron the other person is Robert Milliken at the University of Chicago. Actually determines the actual charge on the electron. Actually gives us the mass of the electron. Because of Thompson and Milliken's work, we can use that to find the mass. Now Milliken experiment is known as simply the oil drop experiment. 
which would suggest that they're using water for dropping, right? No, oil. It says oil drop experiment. Just like Thompson cathode ray tube Millikan oil drop. Now, Millikan's oil drop experiment, again, finishes in 1909. That doesn't mean that he wasn't working on it prior to that. Now, why did he use oil? Well, they were able to use a very fine oil. And, that what, and they were able to add a charge to it. Now, within my reasonable uh, artistic abilities, Millikan's oil drop experiment had a couple plates that they were able to add a charge to them. They did require some sort of looking eyepiece. Let's give the person some blue eyes. Okay, they're looking in the eyepiece there. And the oil was sprayed in. And what they were able to do was adjust the charge, the electric charge on those plates. And because it was sprayed in a very fine amount, how fast those oil droplets dropped, okay, oil drop experiment, how fast they dropped was able to be calculated based on how fast they should drop. The difference gave us the charge. And so they were able to kind of de adjust and really crank it up and almost get those oil droplets to fall slower than they should. Physics tells us certain things that that certain object should go a certain distance over a certain amount of time. Because gravity is constant. Meaning it doesn't change. And so they are able to adjust that by changing this charged plate cranking it up and knowing that opposites attract like charges, that's why the negative had to be on the bottom, repel, slowing the drop of the uh, oil to almost a degree of almost hovering, one could think. Therefore, giving you the mass to charge ratio that you need with Thompson stuff to get the, that to actually find the other. Because you can't take a, an electron because they're so small. We can't even see atoms right yet. So why would they be able to find a, a scale and just drop an atom? Just doop, one drop. It doesn't happen. So they have to find like, well, I can't find this. I have to find this. Just like some of the problems that we do, you can't find this directly, but if I find this to find this to find this, I'll eventually get where I want to be. And that's where it is. Now, I think it's such an important thing is that oil, Millikan tends to be a very forgotten person. But I think it's very important that he, his oil drop experiment isn't just kind of looked at as like a side note. It is a, probably one of the big things because they're not going through a, uh, a catalog going, mm, 
Oil Drop Experiment 2000. Mm, that's just going to be the best. That, that one's better than the 3000 model. You know, the 3000 just is probably just a little too expensive to purchase. He had to build this stuff. Thompson had to build this stuff. Okay? On their own. It looked very crude and rudimentary. And so when they're doing this, why is it so simple? Because simple can work. You just have to make sure you're looking for the right thing and making sure you're going through those things. Now to actually take a step back in time, In 1886, Eugene Goldstein used a cathode ray tube and found out that there were rays going in the opposite direction of that of the cathode, and they were composed of positive particles, giving us the proton. The proton is... Uh, Subatomic particle. Now, it says 1,836. A lot of times, we just round that up and say 2,000 times. Okay? It's 2,000 times bigger. The fact that I write in there 1,836 just gives you the more exact. But a lot of reference material you'll see or read would say the proton is about, about 2,000 times larger than that of an electron. Now, 2,000 times larger is a big deal. A difference of 2,000 times would be the equivalent of like you and a fully loaded semi-trailer. Roughly. It's like, who's going to win that battle? The trailer's going to win it every time. Okay? And so that's where it goes. And so a lot of times what a lot of people forget is Eugene Goldstein. He's the forgotten person of the atom. People that... Did, Determine that the atom and what it looks like. A lot of people think it's somebody else. Now, J.J. Thompson proposed a subatomic model of the atom. His uh, model of the atom had to include positive charge and negative charge. Because he knew about it. At Thompson's time, he doesn't know about the third subatomic particle yet. It's not known about. And so we use the plum pudding model, which I don't know what historical accuracy this has, but the historical story is that Thompson was eating supper and upon conclusion of supper he was having his dessert that just so happened to be plum pudding which is my understanding like a rice pudding or like a bread pudding but has raisins and or dates in it And the raisins were randomly spread throughout the bowl. Now looking at the top of it, it would look very similar to this. The raisins kind of randomly spaced out everywhere. That's the analogy that is used. I don't know how historically accurate it is. We use these types of things in science to help us understand things such as 
the apple falling from a tree, hitting Newton in the head, and goes, Eureka, gravity. No, it's just a story we tell to make people understand some things. Was Newton the first person to ever have an apple fall on his head? Heavens no. We use analogies such as the plum pudding to give us a visual representation, a model of what we're trying to, to convey, the idea that we're trying to convey for something that we can't see. This is technically the second model of the atom. The first model of the atom is Dalton's atomic theory, meaning that all atoms are small, indivisible things. And so a lot of times we just say Dalton's atomic or model of the atom was just a hard sphere. Can't break it down and there's nothing in it. So Thompson builds on that with the plum pudding model. Again, there's another part, subatomic particle that some people ask about. He didn't know. And that's the important, that's the part of the dates that we use. Why didn't Thompson put the neutron in there? He didn't know about it. It's hard to put something in a model when you don't know that it's there. And so that's kind of a big deal. Before we talk about the next thing, we need to have some understanding about radioactivity. We're not going to go into great depth, but we're going to talk about it somewhat. Radioactivity is the spontaneous emission of radiation by an atom. The Carol was the first to observe it, Mary and Perry Curie, or Madame Curie, and her husband Perry, studied it. Now, Madame Curie, very famous woman, chemist, physicist, is the first and only, well, first woman to ever win the uh, Nobel Prize in areas of science, but also then was Nobel Prize, not just in chemistry, but also physics. It's not just awesome to win one Nobel Prize, but to win two in two separate areas is quite a feat. So Madame Curie is one of the greats and looked at with great admiration and fought a lot of glass ceiling stuff. Now, Perry was probably also added into uh, some of those uh, papers that uh, Mary wrote, um, because at the time, Mary probably couldn't have published many of the papers by herself, because unfortunately, uh, History has not been kind to women in science and or math. So they usually have to have a guy for some dumb reason to justify their reasoning. But regardless. So they also were studying it. And there are some things that we can do from this radiation. And this ability to determine this radiation came from Rutherford. Now, Rutherford is one of the major players when it comes to talking about the atom as well. A lot of names get associated with Rutherford as if they were PhD students with him. And... He worked a lot with radioactivity. One of his research students allowed us to count the amount of radiation. 
His student's name was Hans Geiger. He's really good at counting things, especially with radiation. Hence the Geiger counter. And it came and he was a he studied underneath Ernest Rutherford. You get the alpha particles, beta particles, and gamma rays. Watch out for those gamma rays. It's been known to turn people green when they get angry. For us, we're gonna worry about uh, you do should you should probably know alpha rays are neg are positive. Beta rays are negative. That's why they're attracted to the different charged plates. Very similar. If you look at it, it looks very similar to like the cathode ray tube experiment in a, in a way. It's just that they're using a radioactive source. Shooting that beam of radioactivity. That block there, that red block, is there to uh, help focus the stream of radiation. The electrically charged plates to determine that there's different ones, beta and alpha. Alpha rays are positive. No, alpha rays are positive, beta rays are negative. And gamma rays carry no charge. Just gotta be careful with them, especially if your name's Bruce Banner and stuff. Rutherford and his co-workers uh, did what is known as the gold foil experiment because they shot alpha particles at a thin sheet of gold foil. Whoa. Now, why did they do that? It's because Rutherford didn't agree with Thompson. Thompson's model of the atom said that the positive charge was kind of everywhere. Rutherford says, I don't think so. And now we become getting into the area of chemistry where, or a time where they go, okay, if you don't like my model, prove it wrong. So Rutherford, Going. Challenge accepted. Takes that idea of, of, of uh, the Thompson's model of the atom and challenges it through this experiment. Taking these alpha particles and shoots them at a thin sheet of gold foil. Now, why gold? Because gold can, sheets can be very, very thin. Atoms thin. Okay, if you've done a lot of, anybody has ever done artwork, you can do some gold foiling, and that's very, very fine gold. It's small, it's thinner than aluminum foil. So they shoot the alpha particles, and the alpha particles, again, have a positive charge. This is important. Why? Because they take this and they shoot a beam of alpha particles. So they shoot it through a piece of gold foil. Piece of film is placed in a circle of, one would think about it as actually a camera film, a very rudimentary camera film, so that when something radioactive hit it, it would expose. 
It would expose a dot that something hit it. So in a very rudimentary way, you're sending your so radiation source, hit this gold foil, and you have a fluorescent screen or a, kind of a film screen around it to determine whether or not something exposed. He's able to notice through the exposure of the, of the fluorescent screen that the, all the alpha particles don't go straight through. Some of them get deflected or reflected back to them. They go off in random places or what seems random to them as we see it. Looking at it from a profile view, most of the alpha particles, oh my goodness, am I not writing that well? Most of the alpha particles go straight through, but some are deflected. Now, why are they able to go straight through? Because they didn't hit anything. Alpha particles, remember, are supposed to be positive. Thompson says that the atom is full of positive charge and negative charges just randomly spread throughout it. Rutherford didn't believe that. If the atom was the Thompson model, nothing should have gotten through. That didn't happen. Rutherford found that the alpha particles went straight through. They were even in some cases deflected or reflected back and sometimes even backwards. Meaning they must have been approaching something massive enough and having a positive charge to deflect them. But the fact that they went straight through was important. He's able to say that the majority of the atom is actually empty space. Because these alpha particles just went straight through. According to Thompson, they should never have touched the other side. If the plum pudding model would work. Now, we don't just have evidence saying, hey, guess what? Plum pudding's wrong. Plum pudding's wrong. Here's why. So it becomes groundbreaking of the, okay, it's not just two scientists arguing at a conference. I'm right. You're wrong. It's, I'm right. Here's the evidence. And now all of a sudden they go, oh, well, that changes things. And that's what Thompson did. He started the idea, Rutherford changed the game.